Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Taking the Lead, where I get to interview leaders, mostly from the PR and communications world. But the one thing they have in common is that I respect them as leaders, as leaders of people, as leaders of humans, as leaders of teams. So I'm going to introduce you to someone I didn't meet till a few minutes ago, but I've actually respected quite a long time. And it's David Kine. He's the group president of communications of Evoke. Previously, he was the CEO of Evoke Kine. And before that, he was founder and CEO of Kine. So you're hearing a little pattern here, a few connections. But he's also co-founder of the Pandemic Action Network, and I'm so eager to share him with you. So everyone, here's David Kine. Welcome. Thanks so much, Ken. Great to be here. Nice to have you. We're going to dig right in. So I first became aware of you when you headed up Kine, the agency you founded. It was regularly winning awards for best places to work in PR. That's what I noticed first about you and many of us. Why was that so important to you as a leader? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great question about best place to work. And I actually think it starts with the work because, you know, I came from bigger agencies at GCI and Helen Knowlton to start up Kine. And when we started with a handful of people, it really was all about the work. Um, and that's why Kine was established to bridge this public and private healthcare uh, around health issues. And out of that morphed this excitement into work into let's create a great workplace. And, and I really have to give big credit to colleagues of mine like Michael Grilla and Amanda Mullally, who were with me from the beginning, who really helped set that tone. We were a remote working organization before we were a non-remote working organization back in 2009 because we were such a small collection. But we kept that ethos as we went through. And we've been able always since the early days of Kine and into Evoke Kine to attract people who maybe didn't feel at home or comfortable in their own skin in another organization. And I'm really proud of that because we've been able to create a workplace where you can really bring your full self to that workplace and really care about the work you do and, and the people around you. So for me, it's really just about creating a very respectful organization that gets better the more new people join because they help to change and, and evolve the culture. Great, thank you. So your title reflects the ride that many entrepreneurial agency owners take from founder, my name's on the door, to CEO of a merged company, to I have a new role at a merged company. So how have you adapted your leadership style along that way? I think it's I think it is very important to adapt as you go along. So so working with five or six people in the early days of, of Kine to growing that um, to merging with another organization takes different kind of skill set. Um, I will say we were kind because it was four letters and we were able to get the URL and kind.com <laughs> was was memorable um, more so funny. than it was related um, to my name. Um, but but I think it is a good lesson that that when you're moving into a bigger organization, so we merged with uh, Evoke PR and Influence that was Tonic Life to create Evoke Kine, and that's 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 where Evoke Kine came from. It's really important to park your ego and to park what you were to an extent, because if you're truly bringing two organizations together to create a bigger new organization, your focus has to be on that new organization. And not that you want to lose all of the legacy um, culture, clients, all, all that was good about what you had, but you, you can't think that everything you did when you were one company like that was exactly the right way. And you really have to merge those two cultures, ways of working, client bases and people into something new. And, and I think something I'm really proud of is we did that very well. And, and I had great partners on the Evoke PR and Influence side, like Mary Ellen Royal, and we came together and really decided to let's create something bigger and better than we had as single entities. And I think that's a really important piece. And then as, as that grows and, and you realize it's more successful as this new entity and you're continuing to grow, I think you need to change the way you operate. You need to give people responsibility. You need to 
be very open to where you need to shift with where clients are going and, and listening to clients is so important that not thinking you've got all the answers um, a fair dose of humility is always really important and surrounding yourself with really strong people who don't necessarily think the way you do um, and, and I think I've always been comfortable with that um, and, and looking back on on the last 15 years I, I think it's been a real key to success has been having those great colleagues around you that bring something different than you have yourself. Yeah, it's funny. I don't know if you realized it, but you mentioned within that three, four, five foundations of effective leadership, the listening, the the being open and flexible, valuing the people and, uh, you know, uh, just being able to shift as appropriate. So many companies, in my observation, um, they merge and they think about merging the business and the accounts and the staff and the whatever, but they don't think about the culture. They don't necessarily think about what's been most effective from the cultures on both sides and how do we become something not just bigger, but better, but but it appears that you've done that. So congratulations. And and to all your, your co-leaders there that you mentioned. Yeah, well, thanks. And, and, and you know, and now Maureen Byrne has taken the reins at Evokine and, and she will take that agency to another level, which is exactly what you want. Wonderful. So you're the co-founder of the Pandemic Action Network. And, you know, here we are in 2022 as it turns into 2023. How do you keep engaging people when so many people are feeling either COVID-19 exhaustion or vaccine exhaustion or even booster exhaustion? I mean, the numbers of people who get each new booster comes down how do you lead through that yeah so i mean pandemic fatigue i i think is a real is a real thing and certainly is a big challenge for pandemic action network and, and just to take a quick step back pandemic action network was an idea um, of some colleagues of mine and some of the other co-founders that morphed after the ebola um crisis in 2014 and looking at being convinced there will be another global pandemic and even bigger than Ebola and even bigger than SARS, which is what we've seen. And the whole idea behind Pandemic Action Network is to prepare government stakeholders for pandemic preparedness and, and using the lessons of COVID um, to, to make sure that we're better prepared for the next um, pandemic, because there will be one. There is no doubt about that. Just by the way, we're such a global, globally connected um, ecosystem economically from a health perspective and movement of people. There's no doubt that we will um, face another pandemic. And that's not to scare people, but it is to look at what strategies can we employ to be better prepared than, than we were. So when you think about pandemic fatigue, I think one of the most disappointing things is that countries are not learning the lessons and it's very quickly forgotten what we went through because in lots of ways it was a very local response or a regional response to how you dealt with COVID. There's a lot of politics involved in different parts of the world as well. And we really do need to have more of a connected, cohesive response. So Pandemic Action Network is very focused on policy initiatives, uh, economic, as well as healthcare responses to prepare for the next pandemic so that we do learn some of these lessons we learn about interventions like vaccines. We learn about how we distribute more equitably. And, and, you know, some of the silver linings that have come out is that a lot of low and middle income countries really had a lot more cohesive response to COVID and effective response to COVID than a lot of um, Western countries um, that you would have expected maybe have more resources. And that's a real lesson for the world. It's, it's very important not just to look at your own region and, and through the lens of your own geography. You need to learn from others. Um, so, that, so that's really what, what PAN is all about, is preparing for the next pandemic and making sure it stays on the, on the radar. I think we're all fortunate to, to have PAN, and let, let's hope people and governments listen. So all of us on the leadership journey have had moments that make us wince. Anyone who takes any leadership training with me knows I'm very upfront about my leadership failures. So could you please <clears throat> be brave and share one of the leadership moments where you maybe weren't bringing your best and, and what you learned from it and how you recovered? Yeah, so 
I'll, I'll start with the frequent video evidence of, of me in karaoke, um, which uh, <laughs> it makes me wince all the time, but actually something that, that is fun and I embrace. But I do remember very distinctly back to when I was at um, uh, Helen Olton, um, coming into a meeting, uh, a new business pitch, I believe, where we had a lot of senior colleagues. Um, we preparing a lot for, for that pitch and we had a lot of slides to present and everyone had their slot. And I remember within about 15 minutes, the client stopping us and saying, you know, this is what I really care about. How are you going to solve this specific problem for me? And as a team, we persisted in going back to our slides and continuing to present through what we thought was a great idea and continuing to present what we were all about as a company and all of our attributes and our this strategy and that strategy. And it was a real lesson that we need to listen to clients and their problems and in the moment be able to have a real discussion and dialogue about how do we help solve those. Whether we have all the answers or not, um, is, is that's how you form relationships. You need to be able to let your guard down if you don't have all the answers, but I think clients would respect a really good discussion and dialogue and not to feel like they're being sold. And to me, that's what PR and communications is all about. It's all about the external voices that really are the ones who will tell your story versus you telling your own story um, and selling. So that was a really good point of inflection for me where I really understood the importance of, of listening to the client and focusing on the problem, not yourself or not your agency. Yeah. And I, I think for me, it's about meeting people where they are meeting. The prospect said, just talk to me, just talk to me. And for whatever reason, and look, when you're doing a pitch, you're very nervous. You're, you know, you're, you're not always really listening, but that's one of the most important things. Anyone who sells needs meet, meet your prospects where they are, turn off, turn off the machine, just have a dialogue, especially, I, I mean, I think that's what most prospects want anyway, but especially if they ask for it, I mean, there it was, but you know what? I, I my take is that wasn't a failure in that look, what you learned from it and maybe look how it changed, how you, I imagine, listen in meetings and meet people where they are. So that was meant to be. I'm sorry, I'm guessing you didn't win the account, but but there were other lessons that I'm sure helped you with, with future clients. Okay. Absolutely. You've uh, Anyone listening to this knows that you've led in one of my favorite countries, which of course is Ireland, and in New York, one of my favorite cities, and across the globe. So in what ways are leadership the same, regardless of geography, and in what ways perhaps have you modified depending on where you were or where your teams were? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think in some ways, there's probably two answers to that. One is I wouldn't say I've modified it too much because I began my career in comms in Dublin, where I'm from, um, working with HIV patients when the first protease inhibitors were coming out, working with IV drug users who were the first target of that work. Um, and, and working on a program uh, with, with church stakeholders and others around needle exchange. So very much community uh, communications, which is what I fell in love with. And I still think I, it is what I really still enjoy today. And from that day, I knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, and I spent 16 years in the US, um, uh, primarily in New York. So I would say I, I, my style of working is probably more American in terms of uh, impatience and a speed. <laughs> what are you saying? Um, <laughs> but I think what's really important and, and, you know, something I've really gotten from, from living in Ireland and returning to Ireland is just the importance of humility and, and the importance of that self dose of humility. Uh, so I think you just get the best from where you are. I think New York is one of the few places in the world that would have encouraged me the way it did to start a business. I don't think I would have started my agency anywhere else in the world. And the energy and that entrepreneurial spirit is really alive. I know it sounds cliched, but I don't think it is as, as someone who is an immigrant. And I, I took a lot from that and a lot of, a lot of that energy. 
And it's really exciting to be back in a country in Ireland that has moved on so much from when I left in, in the 90s. That really is a multicultural, uh, modern democracy um, that is, you know, shares a lot of my values. And I'm, I'm very proud to be able to bring my, my wife who's from New York and my kids back to live in a country um, that I'm really proud of. So I hope I've been able to glean the best of both worlds. That's that's how I like to think about it. And as an agency, Evoke Kine, and now within Evoke, we have a very global outlook. We, we have offices uh, across Europe and the US, and we do work as, as a seamless team. So a lot of our teams very much work with colleagues in Europe as well as in the US. So we've tried to bring a lot of that um, global lens to the work itself because I think clients benefit from that. If you're doing global communications work, you want all of those um, perspectives. So the stylistic differences that I think we're all aware of, um, and you need to be aware of those and embrace them. Um, but I also hopefully have brought the best of two worlds together. That's how I like to think about it. And I'm gonna do a little plug here. Those of you who know me personally, know me from Facebook, know that we live to travel. We've had the good fortune to go. If you haven't been to Ireland yet, you have got to go in addition to the sites and, and the weather was great. The weather's great. So I don't believe what you've heard. The food is amazing, but the greatest thing are its people. They are truly, not to generalize, but I will, <laughs> a beautiful people. You will just feel so warmed and welcomed. And it's just, if you haven't been, put it on the list and go. And may, maybe you'll get to meet David Kine there. So anyway. And, and, we, and we will be sharing this video with the Irish Tourist Board as well. Once, once Please do. Oh, my God. <laughs> if they need, need someone to do videos for them, I'm your guy. I, I'm all over it. So please do. It would bring me tremendous joy to have more people going to Ireland. We're going to wrap now. David Kine, thank you so much. You know, usually we interview people we've met before everyone we hadn't met before our, our pre-conversation. And I just knew from the way you led your agencies, the joy this would bring. And I hope it's brought joy and wisdom to all our viewers. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And for everyone else, until next time, please keep taking the lead. <laughs>